Hi, good morning. I'm Tim Stanova, and welcome to Work Shouldn't Suck Live, the morning-ish show. On today's episode, we're joined by Aaron Dworkin, social entrepreneur, performing artist, philanthropist, professor of arts leadership and entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurship, and so much more. Uh, but first, I'm pleased to welcome back to the show, live streaming's favorite co-host, Lauren Ruffin. Hey, Lauren, how's it going? How's your weekend or what constituted the past two days? <laughs> it was awesome. I actually felt like I had a weekend. Uh, built some raised beds in the garden. I did a cool little tiered thing, so it looks like I know what I'm doing, and shoveled a lot of uh, soil. So I'm sore, but great. That's great. That's really good. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm really excited for today's guest, uh, Aaron Dworkin. Many uh, people know Aaron as the founder of the Sphinx organization. Um, Sphinx is a leading arts organization with the mission of transforming lives through the power of diversity in the arts. Um, he's done so much. Um, was just talking about his bio, and um, it's it's packed wall to wall. Um, he was named a 2005 MacArthur Fellow. He was President Obama's first appointment to the National Council on the Arts. He's a published author. Um, his book, The Entrepreneurial Artist, Lessons from Highly Successful Creatives, is now available on Audible. Um, and sonogrub.com, the site he runs uh, with his wife, Afa, pairs great music and great food um, and makes me hungry every time they publish a new piece. Aaron, without further ado, welcome to the show. It's great to be here. Thanks so much. So, Aaron, can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, how, how are you doing? Um, you know, we were talking in the green room about how our lives have been radically changed in, in a month. Um, but so how, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, and I think probably one of the key things that I would share is just literally every day, I wake up and fall asleep, uh, excuse me, fall asleep with appreciation. Um, you know, there are so many people, not just in our own community and society who are suffering, either those who are suffering directly from the, you know, health impacts of what's going on, um, to those who have, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, really significant uh, financial impact that they're already experiencing. And so, um, to be able to continue the work that I do and, uh, and to, uh, you know, uh, be able to be healthy at this point um, is just something that fills me with, with great ap appreciation. So I'd say over more than anything else, I'm doing great. And in the midst of that, feeling great appreciation. Fantastic. I'm glad to hear that. Um, you know, over the weekend, sort of the story that's starting to trend is that black and brown communities are uh, being hit um, much harder. Um, I think they were saying 70% of the deaths in Chicago um, were African American. It's looking like Detroit and Michigan might be another sort of epicenter. epicenter. Are you starting to see these things in your community? Um, and if so, can you talk about some, can you give us some of your thoughts about, about how that, how that might be able to, how we might be able to combat that or talk about it, sort of wrap our brains around another sort of racial injustice that's happening right in front of our eyes? Yeah, you know, it's one of these things that I think is um, is so insidious in our society, and that's because it's actually complex. So, number one, yes, absolutely, we're it's, we're experiencing it. We're experiencing it in Detroit. We're experiencing it in Washtenaw County specifically, where I live here. Over fifty percent of those who are impacted by the virus are African American, even though we're twelve percent of the population. Um, and obviously in Detroit, all of our communities that are hardest hit are those that are predominantly uh, African-American and those communities and neighborhoods that have the least resources. And so one of the things, you know, is that it would be so easy if there was, you know, kind of an evil, you know, boogeyman out there and they are just causing the, you know, virus to, you know, affect, you know, black people. And we could be like, OK, that's to blame and we can just solve it that way. But the problem is, is that all of these things that already existed, all of these injustices, disparities that already existed, in our society just contribute. So when something happens, when our society experiences challenges, the bur burden is, is bored on those who are in underserved communities or who have less resources. And so we're seeing that reflected through this pandemic. Um, and because it's so profound, um, it is 
uh, truly, truly tragic. But if we look at the disparities of access to healthcare, number one, if we look at simply um, the way in which we work and those who are in so many frontline employment positions in our communities, don't have the opportunity to social distance the way that, you know, someone who might be a college professor, you know, again, I talk about that appreciation. Mm -hmm. I am extraordinarily lucky that my main job enables me to pretty much relatively easily work from home. But for the vast majority of people, especially people of color, it's not such an easy option. And then sometimes you're faced with, do I just not make money? Do I put myself at risk? If I put myself at risk, do I go home and then risk my family? And all of these types of decisions are just harder and the burden is heavier for those who have the least in our society. Um, so, you know, that is kind of like, okay, so this, this really is terrible and challenging. So what can we do about it? Um, one, I think first, obviously, you know, uh, you know, me and our family, we're trying to identify where is the need greatest, um, especially in our local community, and how can we just directly help out, whether, you know, uh, financially or in other ways. Um, and a lot of people are trying to find ways to help out in their communities, make masks or other things for those mm -hmm. who may not have, et cetera. Um, we could delve into it. Our local shelter association is, is having extraordinarily challenging times. That's been one area where we've tried to uh, at least help a little bit. Um, but then also, I think it's looking and saying, as we move forward from this, and before we're too far removed, where the acuteness of the impact of what's happening has faded, which I think for human beings, we tend mm -hmm. to have it fade pretty quick. So before that fades, can we look and develop policies that will be protective for the long term so that the next challenge that we arrive that we face, because there will be one, yeah. can it be not as deeply borne by those who have less? Mm -hmm. Several years ago, uh, when you're still at um, the Sphinx organization, it, you were hosting a panel during the SphinxCon, and you talked about how the Sphinx organization used row or results-only work environment and, and what that looked like at, at Sphinx. It's been several years since then. You've you've been the dean at the University of Michigan. You're you're on faculty now. You're working in in from the Sphinx organization to massive institution. There's been a several years. Um, can you unpack sort of what Roe is to begin with, and then how it, maybe your thinking has changed or or how it it, it plays out in these different um, size and different um, organizations at the same time that right now. University of Michigan, I work at the New School, Lauren works at, at NYU. We, at, massive institutions are quickly trying to figure out how you put this thing online. Mm -hmm. That was was never uh, meant to be done in 24 hours, flipped over. So I'm, I'm really fascinated by how this all sort of stitches together for you. Yeah, well, you know, it's really interesting because you're exactly right. All of these institutions and organizations have had to just, in a 24-hour period, all of a sudden shift. And one of the things that I always teach my students in uh, entrepreneurship and arts leadership is I said, instead of letting life happen to you, happen to life, be intentional, architect the trajectory of your life instead of letting it just happen and cobbling together things. You know, for example, cobbling together a portfolio life rather than intentionally building it like you might build a financial portfolio. Mm -hmm. And so years ago, Sphinx very intentionally built a work setting um, that, uh, you know, uh, I think has made uh, the organization incredibly resilient in times of change such as this. So uh, years ago, we instituted Row, which is a results only work environment. This was originally founded at Best Buy and then spun off as a separate company, Culture Rx. And the main gist of it, we could spend shows on it, uh, is that the primary um, uh, priority of an organization is results. That's the only, results only. And so what all of a sudden, once you begin to focus on what are the goals for a particular position, all of these other things that in historically we've tended to notice or pay attention to don't matter. For, for example, are you in the office? If all of this is your results, for example, at Sphinx, if you can get your work done on a beach in Tahiti, 
What does Sphinx care? If the impact, for example, on young people and providing them access and instruction on a classical instrument is happening in the most effective and efficient and impactful way, how that work gets done doesn't matter. And so part of the components of this is that there are no standard working hours, which means no one's required to be in the office at any particular time. So any day you might wander into Sphinx's offices and there might be one person or there might be 10 people and you know, you just wouldn't know. Um, some people would be in the office maybe once every couple of weeks and other people might be in six days a week just because of the nature of their goals, but most importantly, how they would want to work. Some people, because of maybe their family circumstances, want to be able to work at home. Some people want to be able to work from four in the morning until eight and then take a couple hour break and then work from two until five. Or, you know, some people don't want to get up in the morning and don't want to start work until 10 or 11 o'clock and then work until three o'clock in the morning. Whatever those circumstances are, a flexible work environment like that ends up maximizing productivity. And one of the reasons years ago Sphinx pulled this up um, and adopted it is because if you actually look at the data, you find that your, your um, teams are more productive, are happier, have a longer retention period, less turnover, et cetera. And that is why that has now borne out for Sphinx over the years. In terms of the current crisis that we're sitting in, there are so many organizations that I know that had to uh, you know, make a drastic change and of course had to do it all of a sudden weren't prepared and there was chaos and a lot of stress and, and a lot of mental um, health um, impact for teams as part of these organizations because of the stress of that immediate transition. Um, for Sphinx, uh, you know, um, not much has actually changed internally. Externally, obviously, for example, Sphinx's summer programs, right? Sphinx is dealing with how to transition those. However, because of the way that Sphinx works, all of its team members are fully engaged, fully operational. Um, right from the get-go, any, even the most quote unquote junior, Sphinx is a very flat organization, but even the most junior, if you will, team member who comes on is immediately issued with a smartphone, um, a tablet if they want one, and a laptop. So pretty much any Sphinx team member can do anything from anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and so in terms of looking at those summer programs now, obviously some of which may need to go remote, they're working on those decisions at this point, then how they do that and how they think about teaching and how we teach a student and can that be done remotely and how to adopt or utilize the technology, Sphinx already has a lot of those skill sets. So that transition is happening relatively smoothly and it's happening thoughtfully and in a measured way rather than being very reactive. Um, so that's kind of how Sphinx has been able to adopt. And again, I think uh, you know the whole team at Sphinx is very appreciative that they're in that circumstance where they can be addressing it in that way. Um, with the University of Michigan, it was interesting because you know five years, a little over five years ago, when I came in as dean, I you know was looking at a lot of these ways that an, a small entrepreneurial organization was working and saying, okay, this works at a five million dollar you know annual budget organization. Now I'm moving into a you know the School of Music, Theater, and Dance, which is pretty much a sixty million dollar you know operation, going from you know forty to fifty full and part time you know employees to you know one hundred and eighty faculty, one hundred staff. It's eleven 1 hundred students, so a much different scale. But part of the reason that I was brought in was to bring those entrepreneurial ideas, but to see how thoughtfully they could be applied in, in a larger setting like that. And especially that setting in a larger, you know, multi-billion dollar research university. So obviously we couldn't just, you know, couldn't just come in and, you know, snap my fingers and have the School of Music, Theater and Dance operate as a row. However, so many faculty in many ways already do operate in these ways. You know, really most faculty members are themselves in a miniature entrepreneurial entity. When you think about their teaching, their professional activities, their service um, and how that gets done. Now they have to interact with the other members of their department and all of that and the school as a whole. So anyway, we began to look at these things. And I think what is interesting to me is that some of those ideas that we began to adopt, we began to look at, and we had in a few years, but some of that pushback that occurred 
um, wouldn't, of course, occur now. And some of those ideas that seemed far more radical, which was how about we take some of our staff and have them work more remotely or look at some <laughs> of those things, you know, now, of course, they're like, hmm, maybe we'll keep that. Uh, and so, you know, it's interesting to, to see how the world can change indeed in, uh, in a month. But, um, but I do think that we helped move the institution, um, you know, which is more of a ship than a little jet boat, um, and I do think that we were able to change its direction and steer it so that now it's better equipped. Uh, for example, you know, a whole department that didn't exist before um, and a lab which relates to entrepreneurship, career development, career empowerment, this idea of how are we preparing all of our students to be successful actually out in the world. So separate from the development of their discipline or their artistic craft, what about all those other skill sets that mm -hmm. the modern world requires of them to apply that artistic talent, right? And to engage in it in a meaningful way. Um, a lot of those uh, kind of guts of that have now been developed at the institution and are at play because potentially this department, which is the department in which I teach, um, has been, uh, was, was um, more prepared to operate in this environment. So the webinars, the online access, some of the, you know, remote uh, teaching and sessions and seminars already were in practice in such a way that the department and the lab have been able to do a lot of work um, that was um, already relatively prepared in terms of the capacity to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm, so one, I have so many thoughts, my brain exploded a little bit. Um, let me get on with my next question. Um, I'm curious about the transition from Sphinx to University of Michigan um, as a founder, because so many founders' personal identities are wrapped up in the founding. Um, and I'd love for you to talk a little bit about, you know, how long that transition took and how you approached it. Um, and then ultimately, it was really interesting, even though you're no longer with Sphinx to, Sphinx to hear you talk um, about how Sphinx is handling the, the connection, the transition to remote work and sort of row. Um, but I'm just how did that how did that feel to you? And how did how did you approach that transition? Yeah, so well, one of the things that I was very, very lucky that my successor that our board, you know, went through a, a very deep uh, dive and process to go through who had been the long time uh, you know, executive director, former director of development, longtime artistic director of the organization, AFA, uh, was my successor. So um, as a founder, it was very easy. Some founders, I think, feel great worry or concern that their organization um, won't continue to thrive. They worry about their successor's ability. Um, that simply was just not a factor for me. Um, I knew that not only would the organization thrive, but that I thought it would potentially grow in ways that it might not have been able to under me. Um, you know, founders you know, continue, who continue to lead their organization, I was almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes a shift, a change is something that can actually be good for an organization and give some new perspectives and new avenues that it can go through. Uh, Tim, you were actually talking about with Sphinx Khan. That's one of the key things. When I, uh, you know, stepped down from the organization, Sphinx Khan, as it was called, um, you know, we were struggling to maybe bring in about 150, maybe shy of 200 people. Um, and within just a couple of short years, uh, Afa had transitioned that to Sphinx Connect had broadened it and now has almost a thousand people, uh, you know, and has transformed as a, as a conference. So, um, you know, would that have been able to occur under, uh, you know, my continued leadership? Not so sure. You know, I think I had some different ideas at the time. So, uh, so I had the uh, luxury of not worrying as a founder um, about your life's work being in good hands. So I think that's one key thing. Also, I was deeply dedicated and committed to this new role. Um, I hadn't been looking to, to leave Sphinx, but you know, you're, when your alma mater calls and when you feel like you can make a difference and that there are um, either challenges or opportunities um, at an institution that you deeply love, that you can have an impact on, um, so that became my you know, singular focus, mm -hmm. which was how can I bring that? Um, so I think both the combination of a commitment to that new role uh, 
a level of confidence about the organ, my beloved organization um, that I was transitioning from kind of let that actually happen very smoothly. Um, also, oddly enough, even though people think that a lot of founders have this, um, I didn't have kind of uh, control issues. Um, whether it's the, whether it's the, you're, it's interesting. You know, I have control issues over myself. I don't want other people to control me, um, but I don't have control issues over the institutions that I take part in, and that includes even institutions or projects that I found or that I start. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, whether you've started something or you come in as a temporary steward which is how I viewed my role at Michigan, which is also why I think that it was, um, you know, easy for me to, to step down and, and not, you know, invade or, or try and, um, you know, uh, double question my successor as Dean at, at Michigan, um, is because we are all temporary stewards of the organizations that we lead. And to think somehow that you're, uh, greater that you have some more divine role that makes you more important than either the person who preceded you or the person who succeeds you um, is just number one inaccurate because history will prove that wrong, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and also I think it's just unhealthy. Um, it makes us uh, consumed with things that a we probably don't have the power to change because we no longer mm -hmm. sit in the seat, and when you don't sit in the seat. You don't have the power. Um, and uh, and also it can cause us, I think, inadvertently sometimes people to bring about a diminishing of an institution. So say you step out and down from a role and, you know, AFA makes a decision or, you know, the current dean of, of SMTD makes a decision that I don't like. If I somehow then go in and, and try and convince them otherwise or even worse, try and, you know, somehow you know, convince others in the institution that their decisions are, are incorrect. It's irrelevant whether I'm right or not. I'm diminishing the institution from mm -hmm. the current leader. Um, and I think, A, it's a role that you just shouldn't have. I think it's kind of a, uh, a characteristic of, of, of ego that, that shows that there's some, that what's more important to you is your, per, your own perspective of something rather than the institution that you actually say that you love. Um, so, and I can, I can guarantee you there have been decisions Alpha's made at Sphinx or decisions that, you know, my successor to SMTD have made that I disagree with, but I do everything in my power to support, mm -hmm. advocate. Great commit. Decisions. And what I've found is that for the most part, almost, almost without exception, their decisions were right even though in the moment I may have thought that they were wrong. And so in retrospect, I'm really glad I did everything I could to support them because it's just helped to further both institutions. One decision someone made at Sphinx, um, I believe it was your last year when you were there, was to extend an invitation uh, to me to join at the uh, Sphinx uh, Medals of Excellence, uh, which produced uh, one of the most awesome and awkward experiences of my life when you said, it's Justice Ginsburg's birthday. Let's all sing to her. And we spin around <laughs> from where we were. And I'm like four feet away from uh, Justice Ginsburg here. Um, and I want to um, thank you for that. Um, after sort of the awkwardness, it was um, really pretty an amazing. It was an amazing experience, both to be there and to honor the the um, recipients of the the medals of excellence. Um, but I, I always assume I got on the invitation list because they were inviting like another Tim Sonova, and I just showed up, and no one said oh, we didn't mean you. Um, but um, uh, that was uh, a moment that uh, when my parents were still alive. Um, after I quit playing trombone, I don't think they could have could tell you what I did in life. Um, but showing them this, they're, they're like, he must be doing something well. Um, so I want to th thank you and, and your former Sphinx colleagues for, for providing um, me with that uh, really amazing memory. Oh, no, no, absolutely. And, uh, and your role and your leadership in our community and our field has been so critical. Um, and also vehicles such as the show are just tremendous, especially at these times where it gives people not just an opportunity to be informed about issues, but also to connect, uh, which I think is really important. One thing I might just quickly add about that, right? So it's, you know, it's an amazing um, experience and the medical 
films are celebrated. Uh, Justice Sotomayor, as you know, kind of um, uh, uh, presides and hosts uh, that um, extraordinary event. And one of the things that I always tell my students is they think about things. They think that things like that are somehow a different path. You know, this is one of the reasons I bring in all these arts leaders to talk in an intimate, small format with my students. Um, that those paths to leadership, those experiences, that that's not just what someone else might be able to do, but that you can do it yourself. Um, and, and the way that that happened to, to come about was through, you know, literally I just happened to be at a luncheon um, where I was seated next to Justice Sotomayor. Um, and, but instead of having that be just this brief moment and, you know, in awe of someone who's one of these amazing leaders um, in our society and in history, really, um, but to then say, okay, to be prepared to articulate and advocate for, at the time, obviously, Sphinx and the work that Sphinx was doing and this issue, this mission, um, this movement that is so important in our field. And to then be able to articulate it, and from just that luncheon, that then grew this idea and, and her engagement with it. And so I would just say that any leaders, you can absolutely find yourself either at conferences or at concerts where you can get backstage and meet that particular artist or at a conference, meet that particular head of a foundation or event and potentially even a Supreme Court justice, but be prepared with those skill sets of how to articulate what your work is, what you believe in, what your mission is in life, and be able to articulate it to them in a way where they then have the opportunity to make a decision about whether to engage with you. And that those are skill sets of leadership that you can develop, you can hone, um, and then bring into practice because none of us will ever do this work that we do on our own. Mm -hmm. so, right, for example, it's so clear, five years now after having stepped down from my role and the organization, the mission, the movement doing more than it's ever done. It wasn't me doing it, right? It is the, it is the collection of all of the artists, the teachers, the audiences, the musicians, the administrators, everyone combined doing this work. And so your ability to bring others into the fold um, of a particular mission or a movement is what actually makes our work really powerful, never the work of an individual. Mm -hmm. as, we, uh, as we start to close, and Lorna, you get the last question, but I want to slide this one in here first. Um, uh, Aaron, your book, The Entrepreneurial, Entrepreneurial Artist, Lessons from Highly uh, Successful Creatives, was just released in audible format. So, so cool. Um, if, if you haven't read it yet, um, it's now available in, in print and, and, and uh, audible. Uh, for those who haven't read it, um, what are some quick lessons maybe you, you included in there? And then we can pivot to, to Ruffin. Yeah, so absolutely. And so what I wanted to do is actually almost exactly off of what I was just sharing, which is that we have these incredible entrepreneurial artist leaders in our community. So what I wanted to do was to help take their stories and distill them into best practices. So I actually went and interviewed um, all of these leading artists across a wide swath of disciplines. So for example, for dance, Bill T. Jones, um, for uh, theater, Jeff Daniels, for musical theater, Lin-Manuel Miranda, uh, Marin Alsop for conducting, Midori for you know violin, et cetera. So um, it it brought it runs across a broad broad swath. Uh, Winton Marsalis for jazz. So I interviewed them and then share their stories from those interviews. Each of them has their own chapter, and then through their stories, I then actually outlined the key takeaways, the key artistic entrepreneurial, um, creative entrepreneurial leadership takeaways and best practices, and then actually outline those at the end of each chapter. So it both is a great kind of uh, guide um, and tool for actual arts entrepreneurship, arts leadership and arts leadership courses, but also just to settle in during quarantine um, and wrap yourself up in these extraordinary stories of these amazing people. Yeah, that's, um, I feel like I need to uh, grab that and then incorporate it into my NYU course on entrepreneurship. Oh. Um, that should, I think all of my, my students should have read that this, this past semester. Um, 
so as we as we close, are there is there anything that's been top of mind for you that we haven't that we haven't spoken about that you'd like to share with our audience? Yeah, you know, I think that it's although things are so difficult right now and some people are finding themselves in extraordinary challenging circumstances um, that, yes, we have to. And the urgent priority is to address the now, but to also be thinking about the future, to be thinking about what are the long term policies that we can potentially enact that will better help protect those in our society and in our communities who have access to the least. Um, and also, I think in a pragmatic way to look at many of the changes that we've made out of a sense of urgency or emergency and say, now that we were forced into these, which of these new practices and policies should we hold on to because they actually have value? And maybe we didn't try this particular remote learning or remote work because it just seemed wrong or because culturally our organization was resistant to it. But now that we've done it, we found that it saves us money, saves us time, increases our you know, employee or team member uh, productivity and or um, their you know, uh, uh, kind of happiness with work uh, so that work doesn't suck. Um, and, uh, and be thinking about, even in these times of challenge, how we can take advantage of some of these things that have occurred to actually create a better future. Okay. Aaron, it's been wonderful spending the morning with you. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks so much. It was wonderful to be here with you. Take care. Tomorrow, we have another amazing guest at 11 a.m. We're joined by Javier, Javier Torres Campos, the uh, director of Thriving Cultures at the Cerna Foundation. If you miss us in the meantime, you can download uh, podcast episodes um, from Work Should Suck website. Um, you can also rewatch um, uh, interviews that we've had on Work Should Suck Live. We now have transcripts. We're working on um, captioning. So a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. Please don't forget to subscribe, give it a thumbs up. Um, until next time, thanks for watching.